A story of forgiveness. Wow. We've gone from one table to another table. And by the way, Liz and I did not even talk to each other about this stuff. We just got it all from the Lord. And it's just all coming together because God puts things together in place. Because he knows the heart of everyone here. Because it's about you and him. Your heart and his heart. His love and your love for him. So we've got a bit of a surprise for you. So um, I'm going to turn this thing on. But before I do it, I'd like to say something. You might have noticed in this row there's some red streamers on the seats. It's because what's happening is the surprise we're doing, at one point I have two people that are my hosts for you and they will escort you to the table here when it's time and it will be this that's row and half of this row. And then when you get escorted back to your seats, they'll come and escort that half to come forward. And what I would like you to do when you come forward is to take from here, doesn't matter where, and I think I've lost the chocolate from one of them, but I've written a word, a word. This one's called, got great. I didn't, and at the back, there's a scripture that goes with that word. But I would like you, when you get home, to find the rest of the scriptures that go with that word. That's the way to learn your word. <laughs> and it's fun. And it comes with the love of God on it. And you can eat it. <laughs> so if this one here with the chocolate falling off, um, there's one in there. It'll probably be yours. Okay? So I'm going to turn this on. Thank you, Jesus. I never find a few things. That one didn't work out, but I did it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I had an airplane notice. If anybody texts or rings me, I don't want it in the middle of the song. Mm -hmm. And airplane mode does not work with that. <laughs> it cuts everything off. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But I think we all need to learn for what Jesus did for us, you know, at that table. <coughs> you know, Liz, thank you so much. Thank you. That was just powerful. And uh, you did amazing me. You did. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for just waiting for it to now go on there. Thank you, Lord. You know, she um, even had blood splatters on her floor. I'll give you a wait. 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 Oh, I 
did work last night. We practiced. Oh, afternoon.
the music, started the music where there had been stillness. Oh, hallelujah. Must I cry? And he filled the emptiness with his own loving, wonderful fellowship. I have never regretted opening the door to Christ, and I never will. In the joy of this new relationship, I said to Jesus Christ, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want to have you settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything I have belongs to you. Let me show you around. The study. The first room was the study, the library. In my home, this room of the mind, this is your mind, is a very small room with a very thick walls. But it is a very important room. In a sense, it is the control centre of the house. He entered with me and looked around at the books on the bookcase, the magazines on the table. Whoa, it's gone somewhere. The pictures on the walls. As I followed his gaze, I became uncomfortable. Strangely, I had never felt this self-consciousness about this before, but now that he was there looking at these things, I was embarrassed. Some books were there that his eyes were too pure to behold. On the table were a few magazines and a Christian had no business reading. And as for the pictures on the walls, the imaginations and the thoughts of the mind, some of these were shameful. Red-faced, I turned to him and said, Master, I know this room needs to be cleaned up and made over. Will you help me make it how it ought to be? Certainly, he said. I'm glad to help you. First of all, <coughs> take the things that you are reading and looking at that are not helpful, pure, good and true. Throw them out. Now put on the empty shelves, the books of the Bible. Fill the library with scripture and meditate upon it day and night. As for the pictures on the walls, you will have difficulty controlling these images, but I have something that will help. He gave me a full-size portrait of himself. That's Jesus in the centre. Hallelujah. Hang this centrally, he said, on the wall of your mind. I did, and I have discovered that through the years that when my thoughts were centred upon Christ himself, his purity and power caused impure thoughts to back away. So he has helped me to bring my thoughts under his control. The dining room. But before I go to the dining room, is there things that you think on? Is there things that you have not been able to, to deal with in your thought pattern? You know, the Word of God says to throw down imagination, to throw down the things that are not pleasing, that your mind has put in. But, you know, the things of the past have to go to the past. You put on the new. You put on God's thoughts. You put on His thinking pattern, which is in the Word of God. The Scriptures are powerful. They reveal who He is. They reveal who you are. They reveal what you carry and what you have. Where the world says you can't, you can. Where the world says you'll never be any good, you will be. Where the world says there's doubt, he gives you the peace and the sensibility to know that his word will bring everything to pass. That God has planned for you. Amen. Let's go into the dining room now of your heart. From the study, we went into the dining room, the room of appetites and desires. I spent a lot of time there and hard work here trying to satisfy my wants. I said to him, this is my favourite room. Wow. I'm quite sure you'll be pleased with what we serve. He seated himself at the table with me and said, what is on the menu for dinner? Well, I said, my favourite dishes are money, academic degrees, Stocks and bonds and newspaper articles of fame and fortune. And for the side dish, well, these things I like were secular fair stuff. Things that were just pleasing to the eyes and pleasing man. When the food was placed before him, he said nothing. But I observed that he did not eat it. I said to him, Master, don't you care for this food? What is the trouble? He answered, I have food to eat that you do not know of. If you want food that really satisfy you, the will of the Father, stop seeking your own pleasure. And desires and satisfaction 
Seek to him and please me. The food will satisfy you. John 4, 32. There are at the table, he gave me a taste of the joy doing God's will. What flavour? There is no food like it in the world. It alone satisfies. That's true, you know. When we seek self-pleasure, we think for the moment of time, we're having fun. We're doing things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying going and doing things. That's not what God is saying. It's the things that draw you away from Him. When you put things as God before the God that you serve, that's when He says it's not right. It's got to be in its right place. That's what God wants for you. Sometimes your car can be your God. Sometimes, like this said, money or your degree. Or it can be your work. Or it can be what your clothes. It could be anything. Anything that takes you away from God has to be put in the right place. So hallelujah. The living room or the lounge room. From the dining room, we walked into the living room. This room was intimate and comfortable. I liked it. It had a fireplace. We stuffed chairs, a sofa, and a quiet atmosphere. I like those rooms. He said, this indeed is a delightful room. Let us come here often. It is secluded. It is quiet. And we can fellowship together. Well, as a young Christian, I was thrilled. I couldn't think of anything I would rather do than have a few minutes with Christ in close companionship. He promised I will be here every morning. And he said, meet me here and we will start the day together. So morning after morning, I would come downstairs to the living room. He would take a book of the Bible from the case. We would open it and read it together. He would unfold to me the wonder of God's saving truths. Hallelujah. My heart sang as he shared his love and his grace he had towards me. There was a wonderful and special moments. However, little by little, under the pressures of many responsibilities, this time began to be shortened. Why? I'm not sure. I thought I was too busy to spend regular time with Christ. This was not intentional. You understand. It just happened that way. Finally, not only was the time shortened, but I began to miss the days. And now and then, urgent matters would crowd out the quiet times of conversation with Jesus. I remember one morning, rushing downstairs, eager to be on my way. I passed the living room and noticed that the door was open. And suddenly, in dismay, I thought to myself, Jesus is my guest and he is sitting there. I invited him into my heart and he has come as my saviour and friend and yet I'm neglecting him. I stopped and I turned hesitantly. I went in with downcast glance. I said, Master, forgive me. Have you been here all these mornings? He said, yes. I told you I would be here every morning to meet with you. Remember, I love you. I have redeemed you at a great cost. I value your fellowship. I love you. And I, even if you cannot keep the quiet time for your sake, do it for mine. The truth that Christ desires my companionship, that he wants to me to be with him and wants me, has done more to transform me in my quiet time with God than any other singular fact. Don't let Christ wait alone in the living room of your heart. But every day, find time when, with your Bible and in prayer, you may be together with him. You know, that's so important. If you do not read the word of God, if you do not put the word in your life, you cannot bring it out of your life. You become dry and your battle the word sustains you. It fills you. Amen? So please, this is what God has put on our hearts. God is really saying something here. Now we're going to the workroom. Before long, he asked, do you have a workroom in your home? Out in the garage of the home, of my heart, I had a workbench and some equipment, but I was not doing much with it. Once in a while, I would play around with a few little gadgets, but I wasn't producing anything substantial. I let him out there. He looked over the workbench and said, well, this is quite well furnished. What are you producing with your life for the kingdom of God? He looked at one or two little toys that I had thrown together on the bench 
and held up one to me. Is this the sort of thing you're doing for others in your Christian life? Well, I said, Lord, I know it isn't much, but I really want you to do more. But after all, I don't seem to have enough skill, strength to do anything. Would you like to do better, he said. Certainly, I replied. All right, let me have your hands. Patina, well, hang on. Chris, can you come out, please? And can you come out? Thank you. We're going to do a demonstration of what Jesus is doing. Errol, can you stand in front of Chris, facing forward to the people, both of you? And this is what you're going to do, what Jesus is going to do, okay? All right, let me have your hands. So put your hands forward there, and now you go forward with your hands, because you've got to be behind him. Yep. You're directing his hands. Okay? Now, this is what he's going to do. Now, relax in me and let my spirit work through you. I know that you're unskilled and clumsy and awkward, but the Holy Spirit is the master workman. And if he helps control your hands and your heart, he will work through you. So swing, do, do actions. <laughs> you don't work at risk. That's really what it's trying to show you, but it's doing the work of the Lord. Okay? Um, uh, we're up. Stepping around behind me and putting strong hands under mine, he held the tools in skillful hands and he worked through me. The more I relaxed, the more I trusted him. That's true. The more he was able to do with my life. You. you see, when you let Christ or Holy Spirit behind to direct your path, to move your hands, to move your feet, to speak through your mouth, that's when it, all things are possible. Because it's his words, not yours. Hallelujah. Now let's go to the games room. I think a lot of people like the games room in their life. He asked me if I had a games room where I went for fun and fellowship. I was hoping he wouldn't ask me that. There were certain associations and activities I wanted to keep to myself. One evening when I was on my way out with some of my buddies, he stopped me with a glance and asked, are you going out? I replied, yes. Good. He said, I would like to go with you. <laughs> oh, I answered rather awkwardly. I don't think, Lord, you should be coming. Come with me tomorrow night. I'm going to a prayer meeting. You'll be more comfortable there. Well, I'm sorry, he said, but I thought when I came into your home, we were going to do everything together. To be close companions. I just want you to know that I'm willing to go everywhere with you. Well, well, I mumbled, slipping out the door. We'll go someplace tomorrow night. That evening, I spent a miserable hours. I felt rotten. What kind of friend was I to Jesus? Well, deliberately leaving him out of my life, doing things and going places that I knew very well he would not enjoy. When I returned that evening, there was a light on in his room. And I went up to talk and over with him. And I said, Lord, I've learned my lesson. I know now that I can't have a good time without you. From now on, we'll do everything together. Then he, we went down to the rec room of the house. He transformed it. He brought new friends and new excitement, new toys, laughter, music. And it had been ringing through the house ever since. Hallelujah. Now we're going to the last room of our house in our heart. The hall closet. Mm. I think there's a saying, there's things in someone's closet we don't want to come out. Well, this is it. One day I found him waiting for me at the door with an arresting look on his eyes. As I entered, he said to me, there's a peculiar odour in the house. Something must be dead around here. It's upstairs. I think it's in the hall closet. Well, as soon as he said this, I knew what he was talking about. There was a small, oh, sorry, there was a small closet up there on the hall landing, just a few square feet in closer behind the lock and key. I had one or two little personal things that I did not want anyone to know about. You know, I think we have that in our lives too. Certainly, I did not want Christ to see them. I knew they were dead and rotting things that were left from my old life. I wanted them as so far myself that I was afraid to admit that they were there. Reluctantly, I went with him and as we mounted the stairs, the odour became stronger and stronger. He pointed to the door. 
I was angry. That's the only way I can put it. I had given him access to the library, the dining room, the living room, the workroom, and the games room. And now he's asking me a little by two by four closet that I want for myself? This is too much. I'm not going to give him the key. Well, he said, reading my thoughts, if you think I'm going to stay up here on the second floor with that smell, you're mistaken. I will go out to the porch. Then I saw him start down the stairs. When one comes to know and love Christ, the worst thing that can happen is to sense him withdrawing. We've all felt that too. His fellowship. He had to give, I had to give in. <sighs> he sighed. I'll give you the key, I said sadly, but you'll have to open the closet and clean it out. I haven't the strength to do it. Just give me the key, he said. Authorise me to take care of that closet and I will. With trembling fingers, I passed the key to him. He took it, walked over the door, opened it, entered, took out all the purifying stuff, the impure stuffs that was rotting there and threw it away. Then he cleaned the closet, painted it. It was done in a moment's time. Oh, what victory and release to have that dead thing out of my life. Then a thought came to me, Lord, is there any chance you would take over the management of this whole house and operate it for me? As you did that closet, would you take care of the responsibility to keep my life to be what it ought to be? His face lit up and he replied, I'd love to. This is what I want to do. You cannot be a victorious Christian in your own strength. Let me do it through you and for you. That is the way that he added. Slowly, I am just a guest. I have no authority to proceed since the property is not in my name. Dropping on my knees, I said, Lord, you have, you have been my guest and I have been the host. From now on, I'm going to be your servant and your heir to the throne. You are going to be the owner and the master of this house. Running as fast as I could to the strong box, I took out the title deed to the house, describing its assets and liabilities, location and situation. I eagerly signed over to him, alone for time and eternity. Here I said, here it is, all that I am and have forever. Now you can run the house. I will just remain with you as your servant, son, and heir to the throne, and friend forever. Things are different since Jesus Christ settled down and has made his house in my heart. <laughs> Have we had rooms like that in our lives? Is there still spots and places where they're hidden? Well, he's a good cleaner. He cleans it with the blood that we heard about this morning. And he refreshes it with the wind of the Holy Spirit. He gives you a new beginning. He gave me a new beginning. When I muck things up, I get on my knees and I cry out to God and God just sorts it out and up I get again and I know. I go in my quiet place and I speak the words that I read and I say, Lord, I'm broken. I'm confused. I, I've been deceived. I've been robbed. Think people are saying things to me that aren't true and saying things about me to others that aren't true. What am I to do? That actually has happened to me. And they are Christian friends that I trusted. And you know what? I can forgive them because that's the first thing I do. And I say, Lord, what is it you want me to change in me? What do you want to change? Fill me more with you. Because I can't do anything without you. You're the air I breathe. You're closer than a brother. You never let me down. You never disappoint me. You always pick me up. And you let me soar on eagles' wings. He does. Sometimes I dance where I'm not supposed to be dancing. I, I hear music and there's no music. And people say, what are you dancing for? I'm like, am I? It's just I hear the sound of my Lord. I hear his singing. I hear his voice. I know his voice. And he sings over me. You know, in the Song of Songs, let's go there. I want you to know his love for you. Oh, hallelujah. 
chapter 1, Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, depends on which Bible you got. Chapter 2, a uh, verse 2 to a verse 4 in chapter 1. Song of Songs, chapter 1, 2 to 4. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine, because of the fragrance of your good ointments. Your name is an ointment poured forth. Therefore the virgins love you and lead me away, and we will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers, and we will be glad and rejoice, and we will remember your love more than wine. Is he that for you? He is for me. He is for me. And I know he is for you. But he wants you to go deeper in him. He wants you to go more into him. He wants to be so close to you that nothing else will ever touch you. No matter what's coming at you, the storms that are swirling around you, words that are coming at you, the barbs and the lies and whatever else and the robbery. He wants to be so close to you that his banner that's over you, he will be in the front of you, around you, just like the fire when the, the, when the Hebrews walked to, to the promised land. He was their fire by night and their cloud by day. It surrounded them, protected them, looked after them from the enemy. Amen. Just as the blood of Jesus covers you. Oh, the blood of Jesus. The devil hates the blood. The devil hates the blood of Jesus. It really hates it. But that's God's love for you. I'm going to tell you that when I was um, in Africa, in South Africa actually, in a place called Dutrak, you know who that is? And um, a pastor was driving us to do a meeting. There was another pastor with me and my intercessor. And um, the driver went to stop. It was about 11 at night and he stopped. And I said to him, in my spirit, the Lord said, don't let him stop. And I said to him, don't stop. He said, oh, I hear a noise in the car. I said, no, please don't stop. I just know the Lord said, don't stop. Anyway, he stopped and he went to go out. And out the corner of the eye, I saw these men coming from behind the car with machetes. And they got right to my window and they were ready to punch it in and the driver just got the car going in time to take off. Those men got fired with this chance of the car going as fast as it could. You know, what I'm trying to tell you is God will let you know what you need to know. He will warn you before time. This is why you need the Word of God. Because He will give you mysteries and He will protect you and He will tell you before time so it cannot do it to you. That's how He loves you. That's his love. Let's go to chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. Verse 4 to 13. He brought me into his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with the cakes of raisins, refresh me with the apples, for I am love sick. We've got to be love sick for Jesus. We've got to be love sick for His Word. Because when we do that, we will walk in such unity because the Holy Spirit is doing a work in each one of us. Amen. Verse 8, I'll go to. The voice of my beloved, behold, He comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows and gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past and the rain is over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth and the time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig trees put forth his green figs. And the vines with a tender grace give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That's Jesus talking to you. He wants to let your winter season go. He wants to put spring back into your life. Spring speaks of new beginnings. 
It speaks of a new way of doing things. And God wants to do a new thing in your life. Amen. Now let's go to verse 16. My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Hallelujah. He feeds his flock. He feeds his flock. How does he feed? Through the word of the Holy Spirit. Through the word and the Holy Spirit. What more could we want? What more? How lovely is he? How good is he? We feast on his goodness, his faithfulness, his loving kindness. Yes, his banner over you and me is love. The greatest weapon of all weapons of the word of God is love. People that have hate and anger cannot handle love. Love is the greatest weapon. Why do you think Jesus died on the cross? That was his weapon to the enemy. Love for us. It didn't deter him because he saw the joy that was set before him. Us. Us. With him in glory. You know, I only believe God is speaking to your hearts today through the communion and through this banqueting table. For we do rejoice in Him for what He has done. We are grateful and we are thankful. But if there's things in your heart, I would like you, when you go home, or even while you're right here, if you need to sort it out with Him, if you put things in a secret place, that only you and him know, that you think only you know, but Jesus knows everything. He sees everything. His eyes are to and fro. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Every word, everything you do, he hears and sees. He does. And because he loves you so much, and cares for you and wants you to grow to be the mighty men and women of God that he has called you to be. He wants to fix the things up in your life. I don't know, Dennis knows, uh, Liz knows and a couple of other people. There's things in this world that are really rotten and you know there is. We cannot deny that. You know, I have been... I never planned this. This is God's plan, not even my thinking. God has put me with people in the occult. I've never been involved in the occult in my life. But God put me with them. I prayed for the witches. I prayed for the Pentecost. I prayed for the Satanists. And they get saved. They get delivered. And I even get taken with another friend of mine who's powerful in it, who used to be in the occult, who was a child in it, who was born to be sacrificed because her mum and dad were witches and warlocks and saints and we get taken in and we get told where we need to go into columns and we try to get young people out that are taken and enticed they're enticed not by horrible people but people that hello darling I really care about you what's wrong that's what they do. They start feeling safe with them. That's what they do. And when they feel safe, they start confiding in them. And then they start saying, here, have this that will make you feel better. I'm going to tell you something. Not every drug addict is deliberately a drug addict. Some have been weaned into it by enticement through the coffins. It's been done by the enemy. And that's why churches arise and be all you can be because we've got an enemy out there who thinks we're playing games and God doesn't want the church to play games anymore. He wants to see it risen. He wants to see a mighty army arising. I have been so many times seeing young people that have been used in the cult. I won't describe 
describe it because it's just, I've got children here. You know? And we're with them. I, the symbols that are cut into their skin for punishment. And other stuff which, you know, and we pray with them and we hold them. And it takes a long time because they've been mindset changed so much <coughs> that they become slaves to the enemy. And this is what Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life abundant. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But the enemy twists the words and says, you're mine. You'll never do it. You'll be no good. That's your pattern for your life. Your past does not make your future. He makes your future. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts I have towards you. They are for good and not evil. To give you a future and a hope. The enemy makes people hopeless. <coughs> but we as a church, we need to rise up. Be all that God's called us to be. Arm in arm. Live together. In unity. And only he can do it. But we're going to allow him. Who we have. He is the captain of the host. He is the God Almighty. From everlasting to everlasting. He never changes. He never changes over you or me. His thoughts never change about us. They are continually on us. Continually. His thoughts are on us. He doesn't say, give me five minutes, I've got to think about this one now. Gee, I'm going to think about you today for five minutes. Oh, sorry, I've got to go over here now. I'm going to think about you now. No, it's not like that. It's continuously. It's all the time. It never changes. Second after second. Minute after minute, hour after hour. Continually. That's him. The one who I serve. The one that I adore. The one that directs me and leads me. Some places in Africa are not too pleasant, just as you know, not in India or over in the Asian countries. There's stuff there, but it's here too. It's just hidden. It's hidden. It plays quiet. Because we Westerners think there's nothing here. It's all good, good, good. G'day, mate. It's all good. Let's have a barbie. Chuck a couple of steaks on. Isn't that what we do in the show? Yeah. Hey, mate, this way, bring your missus and your kids. Let's have a barbie. Yeah. And if you're over in New Zealand, you go to Yorta. Hey, let's have a honey. Hey, cuzzy bro. Hey, cuzzy bro, let's go. We've got the kuma. We've got the watercress. We've got the pork. See you next Saturday, because it broke. How am I? That's what we do. I live in New Zealand, okay. <laughs> but that's how we speak. Because that's how our culture is. But Jesus' culture is far above all this. He wants to have a honey. He wants to have a barbie with you. He wants to have a bride with you. He wants to have breakfast with you. He wants to have what all you have in South Africa too. Because... He loves you. He loves the nations of this world Amen. and the people in it. He created it. Yes. He created it. Mm. So he cares for you and your culture, your family, your friends. But the greatest one of all, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Pretty hard. When I was 15, some of you know I was raped by a bunch of bikies. And um, I was left for dead. Found three days later. And um, God's been good to me. I'm telling you, this is how much God has changed me. A few years after that, after I came, oh, I came to a lot about a year after that happened. But a few years after that, the Lord said to me, I want you to go 
to the prison. And I want you to tell that man that you forgive him. <laughs> I lived in Esperance at the time, many years ago, long before I knew Dennis and that. And I, I said, okay, Lord, how do I get there? I've got no car. Catch the bus tomorrow morning. Uh, okay. I haven't even booked a seat. So, yes, Lord, there'll be a seat there. You told me to go. I don't know anything about prisons, okay, at that time. Knew nothing. I didn't know you had a book in advance. I didn't know. I didn't know they had to schedule you in. I wasn't to know. I just got said go, and I went, okay. It was hard. I'm not telling you it was easy. It was hard. Then my friend Bill, who's with the Lord there, his mum was 93. He was in his 70s at the time. He rang me up 6.30 in the morning and says, well, girl, do I take you to the bus? And I went, huh? He said, the Lord told me last night I had to take you to the bus. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Pick me up at 7.15 because you have to leave at quarter to 8 at the bus. Got down there because I still had to get a ticket. So I asked the driver of this seat. She said, yeah, we've got two seats left. I got the seat, went up. By then it was 6 o'clock at night. I didn't know where to stay. <laughs> I ended up staying at the bus terminal in East Perth. I had to ask the security guard, can I sleep on the lounge? Duh. Didn't arrange nothing there, I just went. That's how it went. Next morning I go, okay, what bus do I catch to go to Casarina? Ah, uh, hello. Uh, you go to Cannington, then you catch a bus from there. So I pull up the train, and I'm like, what time's the bus? Book the bus. I get there, and they go to me, have you got an appointment? I went, no. no. <laughs> Uh, who you want to see? I gave the name. <coughs> okay. They went away. I said, God, you're going to have to do this. This was hard. Yeah. They had to be waiting. Now, what they have, you've got to leave everything in a locker. You can't take nothing in at all. Nothing. And they have to sniff the dogs and what nots and the metal detectors and do the watsits and you go in. Anyway, they said, okay, we'll let you in because you've come a long way. Thank you, Lord. That's favour. I got in, saw the person, sat across the table from me, and I had, he goes, what do you want? Actually, the person said, what do you want? And I said, well, <laughs> I'm swallowing because that was wrong. I said, well, um, the Lord said I had to come and tell you personally I'll forgive you for what you did to me. He goes, yeah, all right. I said, yep, yeah. and the Lord said, that's all you've got to do. But then he said, uh, don't go yet, let's have a coffee. He went and got, because you can have coffee there, or water. And he went and got a coffee, and we spoke for a while. And God started touching his heart. And he said, what did you come up for? You didn't have to do this. And I told him about Jesus. Tell him about Jesus. I said, what you did was really wrong. But I've done things in my life that were wrong too. No different. No different. Back answering. You know, back answering your parents when you're younger sometimes. You know, my mother used to put soap in our mouth. We never swore. We didn't swear as kids because we didn't. We didn't know about it, trust me. Didn't do it in those days. And I'm not, I'm older, but I'm not that old. But, <laughs> but you know you couldn't. You respected your parents. Not much of that happening. You get two-year-olds telling their parents where to go. Have you heard them? Yeah, well, that's the enemy destroying families. But you know, God touched him and he gave his heart to the Lord. And I caught the bus back when it was time to go. Never saw him again. Never saw him again. But I will see him again. I won't hear, but I will not hear. That's the power of forgiveness. That's the power of overcoming. That's, the, that's how it works. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth will set you free. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that bit there, but there's something I need to do with Cynthia that the Lord told me. Chris, can I have help for a second? <laughs> Thank you. Cynthia, can you come here, please? <laughs> yeah. 
I think you're Cynthia. I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am Please. Have a seat. Amen. Now, ask a favour. I have things hidden that will be revealed now. Hold. <coughs> Here we go.
will be sending them to the plate. I think good news. The Lord says, this is a time of new season. It is for you. You're stepping into a new year. Because the old is past. And behold, he makes all things new. The Lord has been saying over you today, Sandy, that he is honoring you. Because you have given your heart to him. And you've given everything to him. And you've sacrificed so much to him. And the Lord is saying, even this day, he's removing the things that have blocked things and taken from you. And he says, even in front of this point on, he's raising you up to move into a new season of another depth of dimension in the spirit realm. That's going to be more for you. Doors are going to open that you didn't think would open. And the past doors are going to be closed. There are new doors. There is a door that's going to come out of you. Because you are a trumpet. You are the voice that God speaks through. Not many people have understood you. But they get it in the spirit. The flesh doesn't get it, but the spirit gets it. And the Lord is saying, from this point, I'm going to get and speak more out of you. They're going to be more in death. You're going to see it in the dead rise. You're going to walk in signs, wonders, and miracles. God says, even this day, you'll start seeing even more. You've already moved in things, says God. But that was nothing. That was just the beginning of the things. That's why he wants me to wash your feet. Because you're stepping into the new. The past is washed away now. It's finished. That's our God. That's our Savior. That's our Redeemer. Our best friend. The Lord said to me this a few days ago I was to do this. I tried to ring Cynthia yesterday morning. No, she but she couldn't because she was at a conference. I asked Chris. And um, so I rang her last night and said, uh, Cynthia, can't tell you what really is going on, but please wear shoes <laughs> that you can slip your feet on. Because the Lord wants to do a foot wash on her. For her new season. Well, I know some of you know the things that God has shown her and revealed to her. She's told you stories of what's happened but you really haven't heard nothing yet um, nothing yet that's more to come yes. far more yes. and God's going to make a way where there's been no way yeah. to you. <laughs> Amen. thank you Jesus um, thank you Father Father even this day oh, can you stand up Chris and Corey Download right now. Fire of God over you now. The fire of God. Fire! 
how you do right now. No more. Daughter of the Most High God. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. Not a real man. Father, even this day, let there be increase of the power through her as she ministers, speaks, and prays for others. More, Lord. Give her more. Increase, Father. Increase. Increase. Multiplication. Increase. Amen. Mm -hmm. come down. Download. Yes. Here comes the download. There's a river. Okay. There's a river washing over the church. Over here right now. Take it. She's taking it. She's drinking from it. She's drinking from it. Take it. Take it. And she's all. Now, Nick and Dennis. I need your help. <laughs> These men are going to stand around and say, you take it, you're drinking more of the river. Take the river. More of the download. Let's stand near. Let's stand here. Just not too close. Yeah, just, yeah. just stand around there because you don't know what God's going to do today. God can do anything. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this joy. I thank you, Father, that your hand is upon her. I thank you, Father God, that you're releasing a new vision, a new dream. Father, that you are taking away what is not anymore, but now you're opening new doors, new places, new realms. Father, I thank you right now that even all the pain and the hurts that she had to bear, Father, that they are gone in Jesus' name. No more. No more robbery. No more. Father, we thank you for the restoration through the family, through everything that she has prayed through. Because what you start, you will finish. Because you are a faithful God. Father, right now, I thank you for even the download of the heavenly realm. More going into heaven. Closer with you. Closer. Even closer. Even closer. That's all right. I'll give you a word of yes. yes. when I see you. Thank you, Jesus. You just take the drinking that God wants to pour something new to you. He's going to give you a vision. You'll be sure in it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Thank you precious one. Shane and Jody, are they still here? Or they no, are they're gone. gone. Okay, I had something for them. They have to know. That's all right. Yeah. Billy and Sandra. Praise God. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. And then we're done. Billy and Sandra. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Father, I thank you that they had the baptism of the fire many years ago. But Father, you're going to release a new fire, the new wine, fresh anointing, because the old anointing is lifted, it's gone, it's gone. It's a fresh anointing because there's mercies of you each and every morning. And the Lord is saying he's going to take you into the highways and byways again. You thought you were finished with those things. But God is saying, I'm taking you to these places again because you know where to walk and where to go because you have seen those places, you've seen the hearts. And God is saying, even I'm going to direct you into these places. There'll be seasons of going here and a season of staying here because this is where he's grounded you, but you'll still be doing other things in your life. And God says, even as he's opening those doors, he will bring the provision. And many, many people are going to come to the kingdom. They're going to come into the kingdom because your heart is for the lost. And that's God's heart. That's God's heart. That's God's heart for the lost, the dying, the lonely, 
the broken, the wounded, the sick. So, Father, right now, while you're fresh and mighty, I just thank you right now. Fight in Jesus' name right now. No more holding back. Forward now, forward, 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 forward. God says, rise up, Sandra. Rise up, Deborah. Rise up! Rise, says the Lord, for you are mine. You are mine, says the Lord, and I have much for you. I have much for you, says the Lord, and I will not leave it as it is, says the Lord, because there's a burning in me that's burning in you, says the Lord, and I will increase that burning, says the Lord, and that burning is going to burn, and it's going to saturate you, says the Lord, that it will not be put down, the water will not put it out, every word will not put it out that people come at, because that fire is unshakable, unquenchable. It will not be drowned out, says the Lord, because that fire is me, because I am the fire. I am the fire. I am the fire, says the Lord. I am the fire. The Lord says, even now you thought because you've been struggling with your knees and things, but I, the Lord, your God, am strong. The Lord says, Jacob wrestled with me. Jacob wrestled with me. And his hip was put out, but I still gave him strength. He lived many a life. He had long life. And he saw his grandchildren. And he saw his beloved Joseph. You may have lost things, says the Lord, and loved one. But the Lord says, even now, your loved one is safe with me. For I have hold, and I'm holding him. And he is happy. Rejoice, says the Lord. Rejoice, says the Lord. For I have much for you. Sorrow may be in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And the Lord says, I rejoice over you with songs of joy and deliverance. For they are your healing. For I am the healer. I am the balm of Gilead. And my ointment is poured all upon you, says the Lord. Fire God in his name. Fire right now, Jesus' name. Miracle signs and wonders. Miracle signs and wonders. Miracle signs and wonders, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Daddy God. Thank you, Daddy. I'm now going to close it. But there's going to be miracle signs and wonders here. There is. Oh, that's my phone. It's off somewhere. <laughs> Out the back somewhere. <laughs> so, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, thank you, Father, for what you have done in this place, for the hearts you've touched through the communion service, through this part. Whatever you have ignited in each person, Father, whatever you highlighted, whatever you poured down and downloaded, Father, Father, may it never be stolen. May it flourish and do what it's sent out to do. For you are the author and the finisher of their faith. And no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against them in righteousness, righteousness, it shall be condemned. Father, I thank you that you are the glory and the lifter of their heads. I thank you you are the lion that roars through them. I thank you you are the lamb that brings humility. I thank you that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, we thank you. Bless them, Father, even more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.